Hello there, Sarah from 17 once again. This is my Uncharted 4 Crushing Difficulty video walkthrough. This is chapter 17, for better or worse. Uh, this is one of the most beautiful levels in the game. It has such a great design to it, and it's around this point where IGN criticised this game for its length. They called the third act bloated, and I can kind of get what they're saying, because this sequence especially, this level, is 30 minutes of us going from vegetated area to vegetated area to gunfight to gunfight, and if you look at it reduced down and bare bones, there is definitely a, a measure of repetition there. The game has done a very good job at mixing things up before the point of repetition setting in, but this is definitely a part where you can feel like the game starts to really, really feel kind of long. And especially when we get to New Devon, and it's kind of an extension of this and an extension of what we've been doing, and it does feel like we're, we're not having that diversity quite to the same degree. Wow. That being said, that there's never a point like when I was playing I swear, where I felt like any of it was of a lesser quality. And I think that's what should really be stated, other than just it feels like it's a bit long in the tooth towards the end, which this is a much longer Uncharted game and in a lot of ways, it is longer in the tooth, it, it is more bloated in, in many ways, but it's because the pacing is a lot more meticulous this time, it's less about everything blowing up and globe trotting. To, to there are these quiet reserved moments and there are moments that do outstay their welcome in, in in ways but at the same time because it is of such a, a high level of quality I do think it's tougher to just see it and uh, right now I'm trying to jump onto this middle thing and you don't have to if you look across from me where there's the water there's an area where you can give Elena a leg up and it's just over there where that ladder is on that other side but for some reason I got it in my head that I had to climb this middle thing but like look at the lighting here look at the water you know, look at the foliage, look at the different depths of lights and the extremes of the whiteness to it. It's just... It's a technical marvel, dude. It really is. The technology on the clothing as well, the way that they've evolved the differences of the textures and the, the dirty textures, the wet textures, all of it is just such a step up in, in so many ways. It's, it's just amazing, dude. This game is, is a tour de force. But this mission's quite tricky. There is uh, a couple of firefights in it that are going to, to test you in various ways. One of them I really don't like, and it's just because you can stealth all the way to your car, but the moment you get in the car, you're probably going to get killed before you can drive to where the game wants you to go. And I don't like the idea of stealthing through an entire battlefield only to get punished when you should be rewarded. To me, when you get in that car, you should take half damage, or the enemy's accuracy should be half or some bullshit, so that they can't just instantly murk you when you're trying to drive past them. It's really stupid. And instead of doing the, the stealth choice, I'm going to kill everybody, and it never feels fun when you have to resort to killing stuff, when you feel like you should have been able to get away with it, and I'm under no illusion, guys. You can probably drive that truck to the area that you're meant to go to next. And it will work, but for every time you have a successful run where it works, you're going to have a run where you get absolutely brutally murdered. So it's it's just a little disappointed with that stuff, I find. So we're, we're dragging this box over to this middle rock so that we can uh, do a jump across here. And we're going to get combated by the fiddly nature of Drake's grabbing. And in this game, it's the best it's been by far. It's so much more refined. The reaching feature of this game is an evolution of something that they introduced in Uncharted 3, but in this game it just feels so much better. Just then, when I pressed circle to drop, I wanted him to drop to the lower handhold, and he didn't grab it for some reason. He just let go. And just then, why didn't he grab it like he did before? You know? I'm doing nothing different here. I'm jumping from the box. Same angle, same everything. And the game's like, nope, he can't grab it. So I decide to move the box, which... Moments like that, when it's a little bit hit and miss on detection, are always confusing, and it makes me wonder what I was doing wrong. It's it's like on a, a quarter circle motion on a joystick. If you press the input for the command before you get to right or left at the end of that, that quarter circle, you don't get the move a lot of the times, because it has to be 
spot on unless it's something like a DP where as long as you hit down and like down forward you're fine you'll get it every time even if you don't bloody want it but we're gonna be messing around with some elevators as a crazy person goes past my window on a motorcycle with an engine that is as effeminate as he isn't manly and this is gonna lead to one of the tougher firefights in the game it was a firefight that I looked up on YouTube to see if I was doing something wrong because I wasn't having any success with it and uh, when I watched somebody do it, it was kind of hilarious because they weren't very good at the game. They were being crazy, is what I would say. They were just jumping around like a lunatic using the rope. And I'm, I was trying to be really defensive on this particular firefight that's coming up. And I didn't think what they were doing would work. But being aggressive in that section is the only way to get ammo back. And if you don't have ammo, you can't fire back. And that's what I was having trouble with because I didn't have any bullets and you're, you're clinging on like I'm doing right now so you need to make sure that you have a pistol at hand that's there to do damage for you and Elena does a lot of shooting in the section coming up so it makes you think that maybe she's gonna be useful and she's not she's a piece of shit utter worthless it's hilarious and in the end uh, what you're gonna see is for the first part of the phase because I realized by watching that dude's video that when you get to the pillar of rock where the heavy is that's about near, close to the top of the elevation if you get on that rock you get a checkpoint and that is all I needed to see uh, to know that I could do that sequence uh, by the way be careful here you can die before you've had a chance to do anything I do not recommend trying to shoot these people because every time I tried I got shot very quickly and died so just let Elena do her thing but I watched this guy dying a whole bunch of times jumping around like a lunatic and then all of a sudden he had a checkpoint and I was just like what because I'd got to that section before and I didn't have a checkpoint and the difference was I'd never jumped off the elevator onto that rock like he did so I saw this I came back I started playing and I ended up finding a pretty good strategy but it, it must be said guys it's still tricky because not only do you have to fight a lot of people that are above you as you're going up with very limited cover but then you have to cross to a waterfall where there's a bunch of people once again better cover than you, better positions, you don't have a lot of cover and there's a sniper and there is also a shotgunner that's going to rush you. So the culmination of it is a pretty tough sequence. But once you do chapter 20, you're going to look back on a sequence like this one that's coming up and you're not going to have any issue with it because you're going to remember just how stupid and boring and bullshit chapter 20 was. And it changes the way you play the game. So when I got to this on the recording run, I knew I could be ballsy. Because I knew nothing is as bad as that chapter 20. <laughs> and I managed to get it, I think it was like the third attempt. Uh, I managed to get to the pillar checkpoint. And then once you're there, you've done it. Because it's just a case of, as soon as you spawn in after the checkpoint, you shoot those first two guys. And that spawns the heavy. And then you kill the heavy. And once he's gone, everybody else is all okay. Because you know that you can get them with a couple of bullets. But this is the stealth sequence where you can get to the truck. And if you do get to it, you need to drive down to where I am now. And up that left area of the, uh, the waterway. If you do that, you'll skip this entire sequence. And... I think when you get in the car, everybody should just panic and not shoot at you and then it should be like programmed fire where they shoot at you at the end of it. Because I just, I don't know guys, if you sneak past all these people, and it's not the hardest thing to do, but it still takes, you know, a path and to, to learn the movements, I think you should be rewarded. But instead I'm going to start killing people. So I'm going to take this guy out and it's going to get spotted by a guy on the ridge. So he sees the body and this puts people into a state of alert. They don't know where we are, they just know there's been a body. So this is when it's going to kick off. And if we see a grenade, we know they know where we are. But those two guys start being crazy, going on weird paths, making weird AI decisions. We get to stare at the beautiful foliage. He's coming this way, so I'm probably going to roll out and try and get him. Yeah, I am. Oh no, I hesitated. The tricky aspect of this is that everybody can throw grenades at you, and the grenades in this game uh, are a nightmare because you can't toss them back like you could in Uncharted 3. And you know something else that I find really funny about Uncharted 3 and then coming into Uncharted 4? There are so many sequences in this level where you have to be essentially clinging on like I'm doing now. And do you notice how our gun has 59 bullets in it? Why don't we get that amount of bullets when we pick up other people's ammo? 
Like in Uncharted 3, when you pick up people's ammo, it gives you tons. Every single sequence I played the other day, I had 80 bullets in my pistol or something ridiculous, and I had about 140 bullets in the assault rifles that I was carrying. And it didn't make any of the fights any easier, it just meant that I didn't have to fuck about looking for guns all the time or clinging on an edge, letting people chuck grenades at me because I'm waiting for the opportune moment to rush out, hold my breath and pray that I don't die while I get a gun. And that's not difficulty guys, that's bullshit. And Uncharted 3 is great for that. I had no instances of that being an issue. That was sloppy on my part, but we got him. And we'll get his buddy too. No? No? Is it? Ah, there you go. See you later. And then the kickoff starts and we start to fight. But I just found it hilarious that I was always in a high amount of ammunition on Uncharted 3. And it still managed to be uh, more taxing challenge-wise and more enjoyable than this game. Which is just weird. Additionally, too, the enemies in this game on crushing, watch this, I couldn't get uh, a sight around the post. That was me trying to change the shoulder I was aiming with, and it was having none of it. But the enemies on this game do not shoot you as quickly as they do in Uncharted 3 on crushing. When you pop out of cover and they're able to shoot at you in that in on, on Uncharted 3, they will shoot you immediately. In this game, there's a bit of a delay on it. Sometimes they do, but for the most, you will never get shot as quick as you do in that game. Which I found quite interesting. So Elena's shooting at the guy who's got the heavy gun. I'm just going to be thinning dudes out with the pistol. Because we've got a ton of pistol ammo here. It's kind of amazing having this much ammo. There's a sniper up there, so let's try and get rid of him. This is, I suppose you could call this me using the third person cover trick. And it's kind of working for a change. I love that when you shoot them, they can't return fire. I think that that's pretty great. That is something that the third game is, is definitely lacking on. Those fucking heavy dudes when you're shooting them and they don't even flinch, that is a pain in the dick. Like, I hate shooting somebody and them having perfect aim back at me. It's one of those things that really bugs me, but you know the great thing about heavies in the third game? When they start throwing a grenade at you, it takes them so long to do it, if you go flat out shooting them, they'll drop the grenade every time and you'll get rid of all their armor. It's the cleverest design for a heavy I've ever seen, because not only are they dangerous, but if they want to chuck a grenade at you, they have to be vulnerable to do it, and I think it's fantastic. I'm now going to run around picking up ammunition, because I know what section's coming up, and I want to have the most tools for that fight as I can. And the intelligent player would not use the pistol for any of these encounters, but you'll notice I was clinging on, and you cannot use your assault rifle when you're clinging on, so... Uh, my advice to you guys, if you're going to struggle on this next fight and you want to avoid struggle, take in the max amount of pistol bullets you can take into that elevator and do not use your pistol until you need to. A la when the heavy turns up before the checkpoint and when you're jumping across to the waterfall and stuff. When the, sh when the shit hits the fan, basically. But I've got 40 bullets in the, uh, the butchered M14 or whatever this gun is. It gives me a scope, so I know I can have a measure of precision with it and aim, which is useful. There's my fantastic driving. I've got a pistol that hopefully has a ton of rounds in, and this is where you were meant to go if you could nick the car and drive away. But I tried this twice, and I got killed both times, so I was just like, I'm just going to kill these people. Sorry. But we're back to some traversal now. And just another fantastic and beautiful area. But that elevator that it's pointing us to now... That is the one where the game gets difficult. And we get to go back through the water, which... The water effects on this game... My goodness. It, <laughs> I cannot say just how nice this game looks. And you're watching it, and you're saying, Chris, we get it, but you don't. You really don't. Like, you have to play it to see just how good it looks. Because it's... It's one of those games where you stop yourself every so often just to stare at it, and there's not many games I can say that for because I'm not usually somebody who is all that bothered about graphics. I think graphics are a great touch, but I don't think they make the game. To me, I would rather have a game that has immaculate gameplay and the graphics are nothing special. Like a great example of this for me is God Hand. God Hand is a game that I, I always go back to mentioning because I think it was incredibly hard done by for what it achieved in its day. And it is a game that in a lot of ways looks like utter shit. 
and it doesn't help itself with the way that its camera functions because its camera prioritizes gameplay over visual fidelity so you can literally deconstruct the world by turning the camera and it makes it look goofy and weird and all kinds of ugly but it never affects the gameplay you are always in control you are always the highest level of responsiveness that you need to be in a game that is as brutal as that game and like gameplay wise I don't think many games can touch God Hand in just, just how good it is at what it does. And uh, that is a game that I wish I could be great at, but I never will be. Because I never feel like I'm improving. <laughs> and if you're interested in seeing God Hand and you don't know too much about it, I do have a playlist of God Hand uh, that's coming very soon once I finish it. Because I have a playthrough currently running on the channel. Uh, you haven't seen a video of it for a long time, but uh, I've got... A nice space in my calendar now to go back and finish it up so I'm gonna be bringing a lot of that to you because it's a f it's an absolutely fantastic game it really is and it's such a humbling game too I really want dark side Phil to play it I do because Phil has this nature of just running past everything and then complaining you know that the combat's easy well you can run past a lot of things in God hand but if you do and it backfires, you die so quickly. That is a game that will destroy you unless you respect it. And the one thing that Phil never does with games is he never respects them. He just doesn't. And he doesn't because he has no interest in playing them. And if he wasn't being paid, he probably wouldn't play them. And that's the saddest part about him as, as a YouTube pre presenter person. Is the fact that... It is literally so transparent that if it was not for the fact he needs to pay bills, he wouldn't touch 90% of the games he plays. And God Hand is one of those titles that if we could get him to play it, it would absolutely destroy him. And it's not just because it's Phil, guys. God Hand will destroy everybody. That's what it does. You know, That's all it does, and it will not stop until you are dead. This is the Kyle Reese speech from Terminator, because that's what it is. And there is such a measure of understanding and finesse and skill that is needed just to survive in that game, let alone be competent and look good at it. So it's one of those things that I would love to watch. It's the same thing with The Wonderful 101, but to a lesser extent. The Wonderful 101 is nowhere near as punishing as, as God Hand, but the execution barrier in that game is very high. And it's high because it's tough to do. And a lot of people confused how tricky it is to do things in that game as bad design or as mechanics not working as they should and that's not true it's just you don't understand how to make them work and that takes a while to understand and it kind of hurts your brain at first but we've made it to the toughest sequence in the level and you'll notice I don't have 59 bullets in my pistol which is really sad because I could have done with it that right there is the game fucking me all I wanted to do was to jump off this ledge and good old Nathan Drake grabbed it and I ended up putting myself in a terrible spot but you'll notice I lived very rare but it does happen so kill those first two guys push over to this piece of rock kill these guys up here I'm gonna get an achievement as well for shooting grenades uh, or shooting people who drop grenades too so I apologize in advance put on your assault rifle so you can save some pistol bullets and start clipping the guys running around here so there was the trophy for Butterfingers. And be aware, of course, the third person cover trick doesn't work so great. And they will hit the tits off you. And you need to know where these guys are coming from. Because if you don't, you're going to get shot from behind or you're not going to be able to take them out in the right order. Lena, still with me? But an important thing to know here is the carriage will not elevate until you trigger it to where you move to. If I start moving back towards it now, when I kill these people, it's going to raise. If I don't, I have all the time in the world to prepare for the next phase. At the moment, there's no checkpoint. The checkpoint is only after killing the heavy and getting on that platform. So be very careful, because it's very easy to die. I've picked up the Rafika right now. I have no interest in keeping it carrying forward. I want to use its ammo so that I've got as much in my pistol for the sequence that's to come, because I know I'm going to need it. So I use the scope. It's very tricky to see these people, but you can kind of see their red helmets. The, the red caps, sorry. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to use the, the scope on this gun as much as I can and the Rafika and then I'm going to put my other gun back on and we're going to move back towards the, the elevator. So there's a dude just up there. 
We get him in a couple shots. Could have been better, but it was okay. And you'll notice now I've moved back across here and now that guy's dead. The elevator's gone up. But it will never go out of your reach unless you're on it, I think. So when we go... You notice how it's moving up now? When we get to the, the precipice of this next area, this is where the, uh, the final barrier to your checkpoint is. So this guy here, the heavy... Getting the heavy to die is, is a work of art. It's a pain in the ass. When you're on the cover down here, do not aim. If you aim, you will open yourself up to being able to be shot. Only ever do it when you're at decent life, because you don't want to get clipped and killed, because you're all the way at the beginning of the sequence when you were jumping onto it. So you want to be super careful here, but we're going to focus on finishing off the heavy, because when he's gone, everybody else is a bitch. Additionally, the grenade guy needs to die because he's going to make this section more awkward than it needs to be just out of the sheer nature that he has infinite grenades and the grenades knock everything, they cause massive particle effects and they will kill you fast. So, like, do you know just then, if that was Uncharted 3 on Crushing I was dead because for some reason that game's grenades are just brutal. But now he's dead, all we have to do is run directly off the top of this elevator and jump to that rock and we have a checkpoint and it doesn't matter what situation you're in when you get on that because it's going to give you a nice checkpoint anyway so you're going to see me when i climb up it's going to transition the first thing to do here is shoot these guys that spawn there's two of them and you can kill them really fast if you do this correctly the heavy spawns now and he's going to put pressure on that first area but he will never jump across so what we're going to do is we're going to dodge the inevitable grenade spam and we're going to focus on killing the heavy when the heavy is dead, everybody else is simple, because you can be aggressive without being instantly murdered. But the grenades are legitimately a problem here, so always drop down one tier and then go back up. And focus on getting some shots off on him. Keep on shooting him, doesn't matter where you shoot him, if you can hit him in the face, you can kill him with nine shots. But hitting him in the face with all the view kick, all the grenade spam, all the other people shooting at you, it's a work of art. So don't worry it too much. You'll notice I don't have any bullets, I need to climb up now, grab a gun, and drop back down. Luckily enough, there was one of those uh, wannabe clobs, those crazy scorpions, so I'm going to use this. Not the best gun in the game, but it's going to enable us to kill him. Now he's dead, I'm going to do a, a crazy run forward and I'm going to jump onto that pillar that you see in front. I'm also going to pick up uh, a different gun that has worse enemy than one I had, which is a mistake, but you know, you don't know until you do it. And now we need to wait again. Another grenade just got tossed. Immaculate grenade tosses as well. They will always be bang where your fingers are, the bastards. But jump across. And at this point, you're going to be able to tell who's up here. So we've got sniper on top, nobody on left, two guys on right. So I'm going to go into the wooden cover, I'm going to kill the guys to my right, and then I'm going to run to them. The grenade forces me out of cover, puts me in a bad spot, but I'm confident, thanks to chapter 20, that I can do this by being aggressive. Once you're here, you've done it. Because the sniper will not shoot quick enough, and his buddy's a bitch, so finish them off and then we can go around picking up all the cool guns and we can go and get Elena and at this point I was really panicking on my first playthrough because I thought she was going to get killed because Drake mentions that she's being bum rushed so that we've got to go and help her and I'm thinking oh no 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 please no no protecting bullshit none of this timed nonsense because I wanted to make sure I had good guns because I was on this section for about 40 minutes on my first playthrough and I was getting really frustrated so I uh I rush to her, and lo and behold, it's just a goddamn ruse to show that she's capable and, you know, Drake should have trusted her because she's a lot better at this than we're giving her credit for. And it's, it's just an elaborate ruse for her to kill some people. So there's no time limit here, there's no rush. It's just the game uh, instilling a sense of false tragedy or false suspense. That's all it is. You know, it's the moment where the hero dies and then it cuts to somebody else and you're like, well, but what about the hero? We can't have the hero die. How does he survive? And then it goes back to him and, you know, he was clinging on by his fingertips the entire time. And the bullet hit the flask in his breast pocket and insert bullshit trope to keep a superhero alive. I say superhero, a normal hero who is a man who can kill a full army without ever getting shot. And when he does get shot, it's always in his shoulder and it's always in the good part of the shoulder where there's no arteries, veins or anything precious. But that's it guys, that fight there is one of the toughest in the game. It might not have looked like much, and you might have found it easy, but I found that to be very challenging when I first did it. 
It's very rare that I go to YouTube to see if there's a video footage of somebody doing it. Because I'm one of those people that I like to be as in my own zone as I can. Because when you watch somebody do something, you're always influenced by them. So it's, it's always best to try it your, your own way and then see what perhaps you're doing wrong. And sometimes it can be really useful, and I always try to to convey to people that looking for help is not a weakness, guys. It's just another step on the path to winning. Unless you're somebody who takes great pride in figuring shit out, and you you would you'd rather die than you know go and see someone else do something. I think looking stuff up can be very useful, and it's not so much for making walkthroughs because I think that's just going to be, unfortunately, you're going to be imitating what someone else has figured out. But it's great to know how close the next checkpoint is, or if there is a checkpoint, or if there's a sneaky thing that you just never thought to do that everyone else is doing that makes it simple. And those moments can be great. And it can be great when you're the person figuring out those moments, but it doesn't always work that way. So, uh, just as a hint from me, like, people seem to think that I'm this dude that just does everything on the first time and I'm this godly gamer and stuff, and it's just not true. <laughs> it really isn't. Like... All of this is edited, guys. You're watching the successes and you don't see the failures. And the failures can sometimes be just the most brutally mind-numbing, embarrassing, bullshit, horrendous, just nightmarish experiences. But you don't see that. And if I showed you all of that, you'd probably get sick of it. Because at some point, when you're dying as many times as you die on some parts of certain games... You know, well, there's no surprise, it's just, this is nuts. It's, you're looking for that perfect coin toss, or that perfect dice roll, and unfortunately you're rolling everything but what you need, and you're getting killed. And everybody's going to have that experience at certain points of certain games. It's just, you don't have to see that when you're watching a walkthrough. And it gives a false impression of how good people are. And that's one of the biggest problems with YouTube, you know, people think that, I've had people ask me, why does my game load so fast? And, you know, I didn't think you had to save because I never saw you save. And all that is is editing, folks. That's me making the video a bit more pleasing for you. But people, unfortunately, uh, are not all as, as media aware of, of a lot of these features. So when they see certain stuff in games, they believe it. And they question it and they're just like, well, why does this work like this? A lot of the times it might be something completely different, like that's something I did in After Effects, that's not actually the game, dude, you know, you've got to try and, and be aware of these things. But a little bit more driving, some car platforming, which I find hilarious, but it really works. And there's only a couple minutes left on this video, and I think the most of this is traversal as we move towards New Devon, which, that has one of the toughest firefights in the game as well, which... I kept doing the same thing in this recording in this walkthrough. I kept finding strats on my first run that I couldn't record. I couldn't get them to work the second time. And it doesn't mean that they're bad strats, even though normally I would say if you know if you can't get it to work two or three times, it's not a strategy. It's just the way that this game is. It's very random at times. It's very, well, that didn't happen last time kind of uh, inducing moments and... You need to be aware of it, guys. If something is not working for you, and you're trying to force it, and it just isn't happening, you've got to try something different. There are times where fortitude and perseverance will reward you, but there are also times where you're banging your head against a wall, and you need to think about it differently. But there's a nice cinematic moment here as we drive into this next area, where the sound effects go completely off, and this music plays, and it's kind of to soak up the the idea of, of, of where we are in the journey and where these two characters are on an emotional level because there has been a breach of trust in a relationship that, you know, relationships are founded on trust. So when that breach happens, it matters. And I think they do a wonderful job here of, of kind of giving you that moment of reflection. And it's weird too, because the, the scene previously when you're on the bridge, I don't know if it's because of my headset and the way that it's audio mixed, but I couldn't fucking hear what they were talking about because all I could hear was the bloody elevator making creaky noises. So they're having this massive, super emotional and serious conversation and I, all I can hear is... So it were awful like listening to bloody Gruntilda in Banjo-Kazooie. And then when I watched somebody else play that section, 
I could hear their game perfectly. So I don't know if it was my TV or what, but I couldn't hear a fucking word. I was going to put the subtitles on, and it's a really important point in the story, too. Which is kind of annoying, but... Look at this location, dude. It's so beautiful. It really is. And I can't believe that there's that review just completely shitting on all this. Even if you don't like Uncharted, how can you look at this and be like, oh yeah, it's crap. It's tepid. It's cliched. Like, Imagine Uncharted if they removed all the moments where shit like this happens. You would have a man running forward, shooting nothing and jumping on nothing and finding everything on the first attempt. You would literally have like a fucking telltale game. Like, come on now, guys. You can't be that strict on something because it's... Like, where's this person's criticism of every Call of Duty ever? Because you know that motherfucker's probably reviewed COD and be like, it's such a gripping tale of war and the pathos and ethos of struggle and strife and the human spirit. And then the motherfucker calls Uncharted stale cereal. Uh, I just, I don't get it. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, guys, there is a very questionable review by the Washington Post of this game, and it just reeks of a person who has an agenda. I've never read a review where somebody so willingly assassinates a game. It's madness. And that's coming from somebody who has probably one of the harshest reviews of Scholar of the First Sin on the internet. But I like to think, even when I'm lambasting that game and I'm insulting it, that you can tell it's coming from like a scorned lover. It's coming from somebody that wanted it to be the best thing it could be and just felt completely betrayed by what it was. It's not coming from somebody who's trying to shit on that game just to shit on that game. That's not my agenda in that video at all. I wanted that game to be amazing and I... And there's people who are like, oh, you're obviously just crap or you didn't play it long enough. Motherfucker, I thousand G'd that game. I beat that game several times and still thought it was shit. You know, it's not like I played half of it and never beat it. I'm not that dude from Polygon who couldn't get through fucking Star Fox because of the controls. Who was, incidentally, I believe, the same person who played that Doom footage where the motherfucker couldn't aim at the first two dudes. It looked like I'd give the controller to my cat. I don't even have a cat. That's how bizarre his footage was. And it's hilarious. Like, these people are paid to review games for a living and this guy cannot use two analogs at the same time? Like, what the fuck's he doing? Is he spending all his time talking about feminism and bullshit in video games and not actually playing them? I don't get it. But that guy's employed. That guy has a job I would kill for. And the motherfucker can't put an analog on, a, on, a, on an enemy that's five yards from him in a Twitch shooter. What a disgrace. And don't get me wrong, it's like anything else. The first time you try to do something, it's not easy. Even if somebody else is amazing at it, doesn't mean that you're going to be amazing at it. Moving two analogs at the same time is something you learnt to do. You didn't do it immediately, it didn't come naturally, it's something that you had to learn. And that guy literally looks like he's been playing on D-pad forever, and he's come over to analogs and he just doesn't understand the concept of it. It's really, really bad.